I, I'm going to tell you a little story. When I, was, when I turned this book over to the publisher, they told me I had to take out 25,000 words. So 25,000 words are out of there. So I'll give you a little story of one of the um, stuff that I, had to, that I decided, okay, I'll take this one out. So only you will know. Uh, so I went to 10 states multiple times to do this book. Multiple times. And I'll give you two little examples. Uh, one of the times, the first time, I went to California, Los Angeles, because I was told that Lucille's sisters lived in LA. I had the address. They had passed about 20 years. But the issue for me going, you say, well, why go? They passed. You know, they're gone. In the African-American community, longevity lives. Yeah. So if you know about that, and it lives in other communities too. So I knew there would be somebody there to tell me something about this family. So I went to LA, took one of my grad students with me who was familiar and from LA. So she knew everything about LA. Uh, we arrived about, and I usually come very early before people are awake, so like 6.45, I'm there. And, and we came to the house, um, and we looked at it and walked around, and then she decided to run up the stairs because the picture window appeared to not have any drapes or anything. It was open, so she wants to go and peek in there. So she runs up the stairs, and I'm standing down here going, she's running up the stairs, okay? As she peeks in, she peeks, and then she runs right back down and says, there's a raven in a cage. I went, what? She said, there's a raven in a cage in the living room. I said, that's illegal. You're not, you can't have ravens in cages. It is illegal to do that in America. She said, but there's one there. I said, okay, now what happened? Remember I started telling you about the community and people? We were being watched. So a black guy walks out of his home across the street and says, what y'all doing here? <laughs> and I'm going, sir, here's my faculty ID card. I'm a faculty at the University of Colorado and I'm looking to get information on blah, blah, blah. And he says, oh, okay. You know, go around the corner because those people know more than I know because I'm kind of new here. Goes around the corner, there's a guy sitting. Now we're talking about seven in the morning with a six pack. <laughs> he had his first one in his hand. Breakfast. Breakfast. And I said, hi, sir. I'm trying to, f he said, I know everything about them. Come sit down with me. So here I am, my first research endeavor, sitting down with a guy with a six pack on, a, on his stairs, talking about the house on the corner. So that's the kind of stuff I encountered. The, the one I encountered I thought was most amazing, which tells you about people more than anything else. Um, it, I spent a lot of time uh, visiting and staying around the plantations where Lucille family w were born and grew up in Virginia. And I went to the library, uh, one of the libraries in Loudoun County, um, Leesburg, and uh, there's one that I always go to, great library. Everybody there knows and been helpful, like unbelievable. So I'm standing in the library and I discovered that Lucille's mother was the daughter of the slave owner, really the daughter. So I'm standing and somebody says, oh, by the way, this is a relative. So I'm now encountering a white relative of Lucille. So I go up to Techie Cox. I said, hi, Miss Cox. I was told her name is Techie. I said, hi, Miss Cox, my name is so-and-so, and guess what I've been working on, and here's what I found out. She went, oh, no, 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 that didn't happen at all. <laughs> Another white male standing nearby goes, come, come, techie. You know they used to go with those black women. And then he walks over, and she then mellows down and says, would you like to come visit me in my house? Now, our house used to belong to Robert E. Lee. I go into this house, and I was taken back to the antebellum days. It was an amazing discovery that I've ever encountered. Now that guy, Wynn Safer is his name, um, and I became friends and I would call and I'd say, Wynn, I'm trying to get this, what do you think? And this relationship developed. He one day handed me a business card 
And I, you know, I know when, what am I going to, okay, I stuffed it in a bag and I never looked at it until this year when one of the librarians passed and I had to go to the funeral. And I opened my bag and I went, holy shit. <laughs> when has a Confederate flag on his business card? <laughs> Is this ha really for real? I called people, I showed them, they say, it's a Confederate flag. I said, oh my gosh, and he's been my friend. Is that, is that not, that's not real, it, it is impossible. I go down to the funeral, here's Wynn, gives me the biggest hug, and here I am with a guy with a Confederate flag hugging me and telling me how much he missed me. So, so that's it, but the journey begins really and Longmont has I have a, a Longmont connection, which I'm very pleased to tell you. Your mic. What happened? The button for your mic. Where is it? It's on the low black. Did box. nobody turn it on? <laughs> I had no idea. I'm sorry. I don't want to reach in your pants. Go. Oh, you have to reach in my pants. <laughs> I'm sorry. That, that, I, I don't know. Can you hear it? We can hear it. I'm, can you hear the mic? I know, but oh, there it is! Oh my gosh! It's for the recording. I know you guys can hear it. You missed, you missed my story with Wynn. Too bad. No, we have the recording. So there's a, a Longmont connection that I didn't think at all, other than to tell you about. Um, I began. I was asked by Women and Gender Studies in the early 2000s to teach a course on. Uh, that I taught before for them on African American women's history, and um, and it's usually national history, regurgitating all the names that everybody knows: Harriet Tubman, you name it, you name it. So I said to myself, I'm going to change that focus. I'm going to go local. And I said that, and then I told a couple colleagues, and they all began laughing. And one said. You mean you want to teach the four of you? <laughs> I went, no. I want to go back to the 1800s. You know, and they all, everybody laughed. Uh, so I put together the syllabus, and one of the things was to go for the students to go interview people who have been living here for a long time and their families. In this situation, uh, on the first day of class, um, students, of which four, I think, were African Americans, about 25 were white students, and they said, uh, Professor, can we take this assignment to Denver where we know they are black people? And I went, oh, no. And then I dug my feet in and says, no, this, uh, you're not changing my assignment. Um, you're going to go and find them. So now I had to go find them before they started. <laughs> to, you know, not so I wouldn't look bad. <laughs> so as I was doing this, I started looking at data, census, and you name it. And in it, out of this experience um, and what the students did, a book came about. And it's called the Le A Legacy of Missing Pieces the Voices of Black Women of Boulder County. And it is out of print now, by the way, because the only made is X number and the printer went out of business. And it has been stolen every time I, uh, they, it, out of the libraries in Denver, in Boulder. Um, they're always having problems, and I think I only have five copies left. So, here's what happened. Uh, does first matter? And uh, Lucille, we talk about is first. And I ask this question because, based on census data, the first black female in the city of Longmont was Sally McNute, a 14-year-old servant from Missouri who worked for the Green family. McNute was counted in the 1880 census. The only one that you have in your records here is this. A year later, Charlotte, Epps uh, Charlotte Epperson and her husband Benjamin and their daughters Emma and Jesura and six sons arrived in Longmont where they pitched a tent on, the, on 2nd Avenue before moving to 105, is that Kiffman Street? Uh -huh. Kaufman Street, it's Kaufman now, Kaufman Street. 
So, uh, when I told this to Deb, she sent it to someone at the museum and they were sort of puzzled because I had trumped them by, I shouldn't use that word. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, get smart now. So anyway, we're looking at a 14 year old and guess what? She does show up in the census. And that's a, that's a, a, a copy of the census. Um, living in Longmont, Sally. Now, I, I wanted to uh, follow, and, and she shows up in the book, so I talk about her in the book. Um, and the students did all these interviews, and it has become quite a treasure because all the interviews, um, people have used them to celebrate some of the women that are in the book, and some of them go back to the 1800s uh, because I was sure the black women were here because they were minors here, they, somebody had to cook for them, wash their clothes, do all the things that they needed, and I knew they showed up. And that's how I started on Lucille's journey. While I was in the field trying to find black women so I wouldn't look stupid with the students, right? Uh, the, one of the archivists at the Heritage Center on uh, the Boulder campus said, have you seen this little article? And I said, what? So she said, about something about a first black woman graduate of CU. I said, no. So I looked at it, and that article said, oops, this thing is going to fall. Uh, um, oops, where is it? Oh. It says this, she was the first black female grad at Pioneer Buried without a tombstone. It appeared in the Rocky Mountain News in 1993. And that in itself is what triggered my search for Lucille, okay? So I'm gonna go back. Um, I kind of titled my talk, Born on the Banks of the South Flat River, which is where she was born. Um, the journey of a first generation daughter after emancipation. So that's what I wanna talk today about. Um, but we have certain things we need to remember in this talk. August 1619, beginning of shackle slavery in the United States. Now slavery existed, that was common. Slaves even owned slaves, you know, in Rome and if you're all over. But here, a, a kind of slavery was in, uh, initiated. Um, December 1865 formally ended the institution of slavery, which is 154 years ago. Lucille's father, grandfather, um, and uncles uh, were all emancipated and therefore they will be able to vote. Um, but then that becomes problematic down south. Yeah. Lucy, November 1893, Colorado women's suffrage at the polls. Uh, we were the second state in the United States to gain suffrage for women. Wyoming was first. Different reasons, but uh, that they wanted statehood so they needed to put women on the, on the, on the group, on the, <laughs> right, and etc. Uh, now, Lucia's mother, Sarah, and older sister, Hattie, was born in Virginia and traveled out west with mama and daddy, were able to vote back then. Uh, August 1920, uh, which will be next year, is now 99 years, will be 100 years next year, next year uh, for women's suffrage. Colorado women can vote, now vote in national elections, including Lucille. So it didn't matter where she was, she was now could vote if it was possible. So I just wanted to remind you of that. Uh, so when I saw this, it really threw me off because I said to myself, okay, um, we have a history of people bear being buried in unmarked graves. Steve Jobs is buried in an unmarked grave. Roy Orbison is buried in an unmarked grave. Uh, John Bellucci is buried in an unmarked grave. Serial killers have been buried in unmarked graves. Nazi war criminals have been buried in unmarked graves. Slaves from plantations were buried in unmarked graves. Why this woman? She got a degree. Why is she buried in an unmarked grave? So I first went to where she's buried. Fairmont Cemetery in Denver. Uh, and they pulled out um, her card 
and showed me that Lucille had bought her tombstone. Uh, how then is she buried in a marked grave? Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but let me move on at this moment. So I went there. Now, what happened is Lucille is going to retire in 1940s from teaching and returns to live here till she would pass at 105 in 1989. She was born in 1884, okay? So when she got here, she started putting things in place, things that with the family that was left, changing things, getting lawyers to do this, to do that. Um, so one day, a very important day, she decided to go get her funeral plot. Now, it was a very interesting day and a very interesting situation with the funeral plot. The fact that it only had room for criminals, not for open cap full casket. And African Americans have been traditionally open casket. All right, so what happened is she was like way ahead of her time. So why that space and what happened? Well, that space is exactly one street over from Millionaire's Road in a white section. Now, when I got to Fairmont, they didn't want to admit they had black sections and white sections, you know. I had to soften them and say, yeah, you did. Yeah. <laughs> I went over to this place and everybody's name I took down, I went on the census and found out they were black. And that shut them down. <laughs> so at that moment, I couldn't understand what's going on here. Well, it turns out that the spot she had and wanted and the cremates was next to her sister who was buried in the white section accidentally, obviously. <laughs> and they didn't even know because her funeral, I pulled the sister's card. And what they did was the word W was next to race, which meant white. When Lucille showed up, and this is exactly what I believe happened, they looked at this black woman and went, W, your sister, guess what? She's not white anymore. They put an X through the white and put C for colored. Oh. So Lucille went there and bought that plot. Not only did she buy the plot for $100, the, you know, the Cremans plot to be buried next to her sister who she adored and who was older than her and who helped raise her. Okay, she went across the street and bought her place marker, marker with her name on it, the date she was born, leaving when she died open. Okay, I even went there because they used to, they existed and they showed me the material. So, but there was something more special because this is how Lucille functioned. The day she did this, something was happening in the nation. Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. That was happening and being argued before the Supreme Court. She taught because she couldn't get a job as a black woman teaching in Colorado. So she left and went down south. All, most of her teaching was down there or Chicago where it was, even though they didn't have Jim Crow, there were racial issues that she encountered. Because she was accustomed to teaching high school. In Chicago, she couldn't even teach elementary. Okay, and there were largely blacks that she taught. So she gets up, that's a picture of her in the house, and she goes, because this is going on on the radio, she's been listening, she knows it had a personal connection to her in her life. So she goes on that particular day to desegregate Fairmont Cemetery while he was desegregating <laughs> schools in the United States. She drove with her, her niece, in her brother's black Cadillac and they went there and that's the story of the beginning of my work and here is what she, they broke up this will be destroyed and her plot will be sold just a few days before she died and we'll talk about that <laughs> all right so yeah it's real 
Okay, and when I showed them this, they really recognized it was real. <laughs> so, here's where her, fa her family, uh, her mother's, uh, father's family were born. Um, Tidewater, Virginia, uh, the car uh, uh, George and Elizabeth Carter, the master and the mistress. He would wait, and this is the plantation, and this is where I spend a lot of time, at Oakland's plantation, okay? And it was a very uncomfortable feeling when I first started to drive up, entering the grounds and driving up Plantation Lane. And I'm going, slaves danced here, kissed here behind the trees, labored, got, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and here I am. And it, it really left a very uncomfortable moment for me for a long time, all right? Uh, now, when I get there, <laughs> uh, my friend Wynne, Confederate flag guy, uh, <laughs> uh, told me, you know, you really need to go to a library in California because we believe he was a pedophile. He doesn't get married until in his 50s and not long after he dies and she takes over as the mistress of the plantation and she would never get married again. Uh, well, I did try to get to that library. You should see the paperwork you have to fill out. And when I says I'm coming to look up this, they say, well, we only have this. I don't think we have what you're asking for. So I actually never went to the California one because I paid my, the years I've been doing this, most of the money came from my own pocket to do this. So that's been my struggle. Um, so now that's, this is what Oakland's look like today. It's a historic uh, place that you can go and have a little vacation. Um, there is no mention of slaves uh, at it. You have, they have dog racing, weddings, you know, uh, marathons, um, and that's the, uh, what has happened to Oaklands today. Now, her mother was born, that's a picture of her mother, Sarah Lavinia Bishop. This is daddy, and this is where she was raised, because she was an indoor slave, okay? And this picture I took of it when I first went there in the early 2000s, that's what it looked like. Well, they figured out that they can profit off of this again. And that's what's happened to so many slave plantations and erase any memory of slavery. So today, it is a golf course and that building that I showed you is now turned into an inn. So you can go vacation there. <laughs> so. Uh, M Martin Luther King said this in 63, and I thought it so applied to where it would be where Lucille's family would come here. Because here became a, a, a point, a place of freedom for them, uh, getting out of, the, of the, the South. So, Loudoun County, Virginia in 1880, uh, Travis Buchanan, Thornton Buchanan, James Fenton Buchanan, her father and his two first cousins, would pick up, get on a wagon, and head over to, to Colorado, okay? Um, and arriving in 1882 at the Platte River Bottom, and railroads dominated their life, and flooding dominated their life. They also, the Platte River Bottom, a lot of early immigrants settled there. Unless, um, uh, unless you were wealthy, you could go somewhere else, but early immigrants. The Italians, for example, had gardens, sold vegetables, and it was an amazing relationship that at least you family, from what I have seen in the, all of the records, were one of the few blacks that had ventured that south on the Platte River rest were further up north, okay? So this is what would happen, and of course this matter. When you're living near the railroads, you have to worry not only of the this, this fumes, but of your children dying, and that happened to a lot of kids. They'd run across the tracks, they'd get killed. Uh, the flooding, again, would kill people. So this happened quite often. So Denver in the early 80s looks like this. Uh, some would be some shacks, uh, some trees, you know, et cetera. So Laura, this is Lucille. Uh, this is about 1885, 
And the one, this is her brother Fenton, the baby Lucille, and that's Laura who would commit suicide and die uh, in, before she got to college. She was admitted and would have been the first African American, regardless of gender, to graduate from what is now uh, UNC. Um, and she would die. And there's a long story, I, I write a lot about her. Um, and if you read it, I never tell you what I think, but I left it up to the audience to figure out because it, one of the things that I'll tell you, um, for those of you who may have read it, if you, I don't know if you picked that one up. Um, she, uh, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, in the newspaper for doing this and doing that, always covered in the, in the press in Denver. Uh, and what happened is she goes up there, there was no dorms for, for women at all or men originally, just like at CU. There wasn't dorms. So they had to go find places in the community that would take them in, okay? Um, Lucille had the same situation, but she found an abolitionist family. A white abolitionist family took her in. And therefore, there was a whole different relationship she built with that family. In this case, when I looked at the records, I had a lot of suspicion. She, she's 20. Um, they had a 20-year-old son also. Uh, they also had a 17-year-old, uh, and then there was daddy, and they were not, uh, they were workers, uh, and something went down because she dropped out of school before the semester ends, gets back home and says, I'm so depressed, I'm working so hard, she never really registered, and she then will take a gun one day um, in December of 1899 and kill herself with the gun in her chest. It will take her two days to die. Uh, so I always have a feeling of what actually happened that she would not tell the parents. Uh, so the, in 1882, there was something called the Barnum Edition, uh, and it was unincorporated, and he had that guy, uh, which is, uh, you know, the trunk of that era. <laughs> oh, shucks, I use that word again. Uh, uh, owned that, 720 acres of land in Denver, he owned. And decided, you know, this is going to be a town, and I'm going to make some money, I'm going to name it after friends I know, and all the streets will be great. Uh, it becomes incorporated in 1888, but in 1882, he wants to start selling. And he puts an ad out, it's the same time that Lucille's parents come to town, and Mama, Sarah, had a hundred bucks. I wonder where she got that from. Daddy, maybe? who was trying to get her out of town because she was getting to look too much like him. Who knows? But she gets $100, she leaves, and she buys five lots of land. But couldn't settle there because there was no water. Water was a problem. It was thick soil. It was a clay soil. They couldn't grow too much. So there was issues until they would eventually move in there uh, in about 18, little late, about six, seven years later. So. Uh, this is what the house looked like. It's a 227 Raleigh Street. The house they built is still standing. This is what it looked like in the 1800s. That's what it looks like. I took that probably about 2010 maybe. It is however flipped. So the outside is still there, but the inside has been changed tremendously. Um, and it was sold when Lucille lived there and she was taken out of her home at 103 because the fire department first responders didn't like when she called them to say I'm hearing noises. She was blind then. They thought she was dreaming it up in her head when there was actually noises she was hearing from the rowdy kids next door and the alcoholic parents. Uh, that's what was told to me by people who lived in the neighborhood. Nobody asked. So they dragged her out of here when she was fighting and put her into a nursing home. And, uh, and they sold it for 65000 It's worth 500000 today. Uh, so that's some of the house. They had a great <coughs> fire. That fireplace is still there. Um, it was all the German craftsmen helped it build the inside. It's perfect. Um, this is the Phil Park School 
uh, that uh, she went to in that neighborhood, um, elementary through high school, uh, and Lucille graduated in 1901. Now, she would go to uh, teacher college in 1903. So what did she do from 1901 to when she gets admitted? Well, she was so far ahead. Uh, than most people. You ever heard of a gap year? Anybody? <laughs> Guess who took a gap year? Yeah. Lucille. She went to upstate New York working for a book publishing company in Niagara Falls at 18 years of age. Hello? Okay. Then she comes back. She couldn't get enrolled so she took a job working as, a, as an accountant in, in a black cleaning company. And then she would go here. So she did this amazing. Um, <laughs> uh, so this is what Cranford Hall looked like. And the, by the way, the abolitionist that she lived with gave $50 to have that hall built. Um, they, you know, uh, so she was in a good relationship when she <coughs> went to school here. Um, so she attended it from 1903 to 1905. Uh, this is a class photo, and when I went up to interview folks up there to check their archives, they showed me this and said, there's no black people here. I said, could you bring me a magnifying glass? <laughs> and when it did, I said, could you come over here and you see this little space here? She's brown. <laughs> and they went, oh, really? Yes. So they had to throw out the one they had graduated in 1911 that they had big posters off. And then she, this is 1905. So that comes up with the changing of history constantly when I go to these places. Uh, so this is what she looked like when she graduated, but there was a payback. And it was an amazing thing because from 1903 to 1905, what the state did was to let students get a free education and they had to pay back by teaching in the state. Yeah. You know, that was a trade-off. You get a free education, so you teach. You know, imagine that. We have a problem with teaching today. We can't find teachers. Give them a free education. Ask, keep them here. No. So she had to teach for Colorado. Well, when she put herself together and she got great grades because I've seen her transcripts. Great grades, everything perfect. It's the first time she took a, cl a class in German. In Raleigh Street, they lived next to the Germans. It was German craftsmen who did the inside of that house. Mm -hmm. So she had that relationship with Europeans from very early. And I tell people, Lucille saw herself as good as or better than any white person. Mm -hmm. That has always been her, her behavior, okay? Uh, so, teach for Colorado, she couldn't get a job here. She even applied to a place that no longer exists called Maitland, Colorado was 165 miles from Denver to teach in a company town. And I read the article in the newspaper published back then. They had a newspaper that said, first black woman graduate from Union will be coming here, but there's no place for her. There's no this. So she didn't get, but she was clever. Zion Baptist Church was her church in Denver. So she went to the reverend. Um, Reverend Ford, whose wife was Justina Ford, uh, the first black woman to get a, 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 a medical degree for t uh, delivering babies, and has delivered most babies in that period of time, thousands of babies she took care of. Um, and she went there, and within a few uh, calls, uh, she gets a job down south. So she leaves Colorado for the first time. And she ended up at Arkansas Baptist College in Little Rock from 1905 to 1909. And that's the college, some of the leaves are not as clear. Because this is Miss Lucille, you know, the picture, that's a much better picture on here. So she was hired to teach literature and science at the Arkansas Baptist College in Little Rock and will leave soon to enter upon her duties, same year she graduated. And that was in the newspaper here in Colorado. Uh, she then will leave there and she will end up going to Langston High School in Hot Springs. So she goes from there up to Hot Springs. Hot Springs was an interesting place for her because people, uh, some guys started paying attention to her and write her love letters. 
So there's some amazing love letters. I've never seen men write love letters like this. If you want to read love letters from guys, read those love letters. Who are these people? So they wrote her these love letters. She dissed them, of course. <laughs> she said, no, I'm not ready. Goodbye. Um, but it also was the place whereby she would leave here out of anger of something. And then they would beg her to come back because she understood, she knew how to use certain skills in order to get things. The school got burned down, they weren't moving it fast enough, and there were a whole lot of things that happened here in Hot Springs. The, the, uh, so when she quits, the principal sends her this letter to Denver, which I have a copy of, and it says, please come back. We do not know what to do if you're not back here. You're the greatest teacher. Come back, on and on and on. So she then would leave and enter University of Colorado in 1960. Now she had an opportunity to go to uh, um, University of Chicago because during all this time she went down there to take some courses and she liked Chicago, but she decided no, she'll come back here smart because it was cheaper. I figured it out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was not <laughs> smart. So getting to Boulder, um, she took up that, that, that train and it's called the Kite Route and it will go from Boulder to Long, uh, to um, Louisville, to Long here, to Long and then it will go around and go back to Denver. So there was this trip around that she ended up taking. Uh, Maggie Auditorium is where she would graduate from. Uh, she majored in German. Um, I also read Latin. And uh, one of the things that happened to her here is the, the father had died in 2017 while she is taking classes. Mother is in full black mourning. She, they, mother gets dressed, sisters get dressed, they go up here. And um, I interviewed her niece, who was 90 when I interviewed her. And she told me that Aunt Lucy told, always told them uh, that when she gets here, a white female student came up to her while she's sitting waiting to go up and said, here's your diploma, Lucille, I'll be your stand-in. Oh. Uh, but that was not unusual because Boulder High, I found out, also did not let African-Americans go, up. They, they had their, their graduation at Mackey Auditorium also. Now it's a course field, okay? But they had it there and they would not let the African-American students uh, go and get their diploma, they mailed it to them at home. So that's what happened, and she never walked across the stage. But what happened, something very magnificent. Uh, this magazine that W, why then has S, and the WBD boy started a magazine called Crisis, NAACP, all right? And what he did was fascinating back then, and did for many, many years. Found out every black student that graduated from a college. I don't know how, without email, you know, without the internet. He did this and he put them in there, some with pictures and tell them where they graduated. So whatever they did to her here, it didn't matter to her because she got national attention. National attention, it says, Miss L. B. Buchanan, Colorado, June 1918. And that's Lucille's picture up in that corner up there. Um, and <laughs> she actually appears twice in it. Um, in here. So it didn't matter in that sense. Um, so she ended up back from here going to uh, Lincoln High School in Kansas City where she would teach from 1918-1925. And Kansas City was an amazing um, experience for her. Several things would happen. Uh, she was an avid baseball fan and loved baseball didn't matter. You know, and I talk about baseball in Colorado, black baseball here. So in Boulder, for example, we had a team called the Boulder Blues. Uh, I had the only picture I think exist of it uh, at this moment because somebody gave that to me on a, for another project. But the Kansas City Monarchs, uh, her high school that she's teaching in used to be the band that led the Monarchs into the stadium. So they played and people went down to watch these guys play music, all right, leading them. Um, and it was also the 1920s, the flapper. She now would bob her hair, lower her neckline, pull up her dress a little higher, and then bought fancy shoes. 
and here is her shoes that today is the 2019 artifact of Col the state of Colorado. It has been elected to be that. Uh, I gave this pair of shoes to the Boulder Museum. I didn't know what they were going to do with it. And the next thing I know, it's now, it, went, it was put against the Molly Brown House. That, it, it, that they didn't win? A stage coach? Somebody's diary from World War II? The shoes won. So it's a national <laughs> artifact of the year. Um, but what's interesting about it for, for all of you to know, Shoes were, some shoes, shoemaking shops, and I tracked down who made these, oh boy, did I do work on this. Uh, they made limited editions of certain shoes. And those limited editions in here, it was only 500 they made of that, that style. So there's a 500 still inside the shoes, and on the top is the number that she bought, which is like 235. <laughs> So that's kind of what Kansas City would represent uh, to Lucille. Um, now Lucille will get married. She will get married to this guy who of himself has the most fascinating. He was, when he got a degree in German, again, from Columbia University in New York, he was the only Phi Beta Kappa in 2010 when he graduated that was African-American in the nation, and they would not have another Phi Beta Kappa Black until 50 years later. Um, John W. Jones was just fantastic, gorgeous, everything. Um, and they, uh, you know, she would get a job here at Stephen Douglas School. He had, he had two BA degrees, one in religion and one in German. Um, he taught at a university with with the with the uh, president of that university co-taught a class, okay. Uh, but when he gets to Chicago after they get married, they get married in Chicago. He couldn't get a job as a teacher, and he left a job as a principal in, in where he was in Winston Salem, North Carolina, at a Slater a Slater School, okay. And he couldn't get a job in Chicago, and where he ended up was in the post office until he would die. And I, you know, I don't know if you know, but if anybody, you know, uh, work at the post office, their records are in the archives and you can go get them. I got all his archives when he wrote nasty letters to the post office about how he was being treated. Everything is, in, is, is available. So this is John, but their marriage will fall apart. Um, and it was, uh, I, I'm, I hope you all would, might understand what I'm about to say. It was a broke back marriage. Does anybody know what that is? He was gay. Now he, she would not have left him. Be, uh, that because I interviewed a number of elderly black women who says, okay, she would never have left him. What the court says is that he was abusive. That's the only reason because what would have happened? Being married meant something. Didn't matter if your husband was gay. So what they would have had is separate bedrooms. And, but they would have stayed together. Uh, and I, I didn't write that in the book, but people told me that after I did, uh, trying to figure out what actually happened. Uh, so, at Fairmont Cemetery, what happened with Lucille, and as you see, this is the tombstone, the unmarked place. It's where her sister, uh, Hattie, had bought five lots of plots of land in the black section. And she's buried there, Hattie, her daughter, um, her husband, uh, another relative, and they had a space, and the cemetery knew that. Uh, and although there was a lot of mess, mess, messiness going on, it will turn out that that's where she would end up without a tombstone. A person who had, whose daddy has a town name after him called Walsenburg, he went to see you. He was a history buff. He decided before he passed that he would have her name put on the tombstone, and that's how he got there. It's very tiny. I went to the cemetery, I cannot tell you how many times looking for her. It's not there, where is it? And I would go back and say it's there. So it's at the back of the tombstone. Uh, it's not on front prominent. So that's where she is. Um, and why is her story important? 
Uh, well, there she is with uh, one of her, um, uh, the person who bought the house, um, and some lessons learned. Write your history, uh, deposit it in an archive. Uh, tell your own story. Your history is truly mag mag majestic, uh, a, a sense to, uh, of worth. Uh, for every woman who uh, rises above the horizon to achieve notice, there are many who contribute to America's greatness day to day and, and sacrifices and never get told. Um, I uh, don't be a footnote to history and women retrieve your maiden name. The most difficult thing is women give up their maiden name when you're looking for them and you cannot find them uh, at all. And I experienced this in this. Go back, put your maiden name in no matter what. Um, and uh, finally, who, uh, who is the public administrator for, for, for here? What happened with Lucille when she was taken out of her home is that they said, oh, there's nobody here, although she did have relatives in town. They were angry with her. Uh, and they decided that they would put her in charge, the public administrator for Denver would be put in charge. It says public administrator. It's a private attorney. He gets a point here. Steinrod. Yeah, yeah. What did you say? One of the Yes, one of the worst. So Steinrod was in charge. And Steinrod just unbelievable, made up stuff, ripped her off. I cannot believe. And it, he would not give me his records. Uh, I had to go to the court, and one day somebody, a young woman was working, she said, you've been here so many times, she says, I'll help you. Uh, and she, the court, one of the you know, workers there, uh, asked him for it, and I got this thing this thick. And when I read it, I realized how abusive it was and what happened to her. Um, it was so abusive that one day she did a sit down uh, in a church. Uh, she, at 103, decided that she wasn't going to let them mess around with her anymore. Um, and uh, she went to Zion Baptist Church, got all dressed up, everybody left, and she's sitting there and not leaving. So she, <laughs> she says, I want to be taken back to my home. And of course they couldn't do that because Zion Baptist Church owned the cemetery, uh, facility where she was living. And that became quite a, a, a turmoil. Um, but that's the, the thing that's important. Um, what, how am I on time? About 10 minutes. Okay. I just want to say one more thing that I think uh, I'd like to say. I work on an area that's called history from below. Most of our history is history from celebrities mm -hmm. we read, mm -hmm. politicians, mm -hmm. uh, people who have money, mm -hmm. uh, etc. We make history, all of us here, and our voices are not there. It's called History from Below, and I believe strongly in that. My next project, I do have two projects, is looking at History from Below again. Um, that's something that we need to emphasize and make sure it gets into our public school systems and everywhere else. Um, now, uh, and uh, Lucille Berkeley Buchanan Jones was a woman of strong constitution and substance, the daughter of pioneer and emancipated slaves who traveled west to Colorado in order to forge a new life in the Mile High City. Um, Lucy's life straddled two centuries. Over the course of ten and a half decades, she bore witness to many historic events which would shape not just Colorado and U.S. history, but world history as well. She lived through the progressive era, the Roaring Twenties, the Great Depression, Roosevelt's New Deal, uh, the uh, Johnson Great Society, the Vietnam War, the rise of the silent majority that propelled Richard Nixon into, into the presidency, and the Watergate scandal that brought him down. Uh, when crayons were invented in 1903, she was a high school student in Denver. She became a flapper in the 1920s by bobbing her hair in Kansas City. She lived through 34 major wars and conflicts in which the United States was directly in, uh, involved. She was there for the birth of Coca-Cola, Lifesavers, drinking straws, <laughs> frozen food, scotch tape, freeze-dried coffee, and so much more. She saw the onset of the counterculture in the 1960s, which gave rise to the new left. Feminism, civil rights, environmental activism, gay liberation, and the black power movement. 
She listened on her radio when James Brown belted out, Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Mm. Sam Cooks, a change is coming, is gonna come. And Nina Simone's Mississippi Goddamn. Mm. She was mindful of the rise of Dr. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and Robert F. Kennedy, and sadly their deaths through an assassin's bullet. She experienced travel by wagon and rail, and saw the invention of the automobile right here in Denver, by the way, and the airplane. She grew up and matured doing um, and matured along with radio, the phonograph, phot photographic film, motion pictures, and television, as well as the technologies that would create the internet. She survived the brutal influenza pandemic of the 20th, 20th century, which killed more than 40 million people. She was 20, she saw 20 presidents take office and live through the assassination of two. William McKinley in 1901 and John F. Kennedy in 1963. A staunch Republican, she got to see that after women received the right to vote in 1920, seven Republicans she voted for were elected in the presidency. The issue was for her, Lincoln freed the slaves. It, they were the Republicans who did this. I am not going to abandon it. That was basically it. You know, even though she might have struggled, it was had to do so, solely with Lincoln, all right, and her parents, all right. Uh, as a student entering the University of Colorado during World War I, she witnessed the significant impact the war had on academic life and how administrators, faculty, staff, and students contributed to the war effort. On the other hand, as a more mature student who had lived in Jim Crow South, she was more skilled uh, battling the racial infringement she faced on the campus, uh, in the classroom, and in the Boulder community. Back home in Denver, um, she read in the local black newspaper, the Colorado Statesman, about the rise of Marcus Garvey's black nationalist organization, the United Negro Improvement Association, in 1916, and its commitment to racial pride and economy. Um, Lucille, I began my search for Lucille by questioning who validates the history makers, especially at the university. At the same time, I was intrigued by memory, whether individual, group, family, or public in historical thinking. But Lucille's story sharpened my understanding of the extent to which historical memory is forged and forgotten, whether as a result of the acceptance of local mythology incomplete research or the prejudices of those who decide who or what constitute history. I needed people's memory to help reconstruct Lucille's life. I needed the mistress, mistress's plantation diary to understand how she, re she reacted to the defiance of slaves and freed women during the end of the Civil War and in Reconstruction. I needed Lucille's notes about the Republican Party to understand her support of the party in the midst of the black, ab um, black abandonment. I need to understand her insistence on being called Mrs. Jones, even after she walked away from an abusive relationship. I needed to understand how our lives intersected in the face of overt racism and polite racism in an elite and privileged city, in an institution of higher education bearing the same. I needed to understand the communicative practices she employed to maintain her dignity across racial boundaries. Lucille made history and changed history, not through headlines and not on the national stage, but through her quiet, sometimes firm, unassuming ways and always, always on her own terms. And as I look back on my journey through her life, I'm reminded of the words of writer and editor Philip Elmer DeWitt who said, some people make headlines while others make history. Lucille made history. Thank you very much. No. Yeah. I got one comment. I uh, what hit me the most when you were presenting was about them stealing her plot and not allowing yes. her to have Oh, it's plot. horrible. And I remember when I was organizing out in the countryside in Alabama in '65, I'd come up to a old house shack, an elder, always one of yeah, the yeah, men didn't live yeah. that long. And they would have to pay 
50 cents cash every month, the white man would come back to get their burial insurance. Yeah. Yeah. So it really hit me. Mm. Even down in the rural south, they're paying for burial insurance. And even up here in good old Denver, yeah. she paid $100. And for I know we buried in a plot, by the way. I found that out. Yeah. They didn't okay. hide that from me. And yeah. I thought of calling his family. <laughs> Okay, okay, great. You can maybe talk about that. That's great. Yeah. Any other questions yet? What was the work she did for the book publisher in upstate New York? Um, I have the name. I can give it to you in the book. Uh, she she went to uh, it was Niagara Falls, is where she she went. Um, and I I have it there. I can give it to you. I yes. Was wondering if she were in accounting because she's back to Denver, you said. Yeah. She began she began taking the books for a, a company here. Yeah. Yeah, so that's interesting. I was wondering if there's any way you can track down the book. My book? Yeah. Yeah. Is there any way to track down the book? So I, so I, who, who asked that question? I did. Oh, um, so I looked at our catalog and I am horrified to find out that we don't have it at this library. That will be rectified. In the in the meantime, I'm actually I'm the person that does all the interlibrary loans for the for the library. So please come find me. We will get that book to you one way or the other. It's also on Amazon. It's still there. I haven't checked out. Oh sorry. Really quickly. That's funny. <laughs> but there's a lot, the thing is, what's most amazing, it, it took me, you know, nine months to take out 25,000 words. It was like, oh my gosh. And I was angry. I was like, you know, I had to have other people look at it. I don't want to touch this. I'm so mad. <laughs> and what happened? Here's something that has happened since then. And I called the publisher and asked if I can do that. They said yes. I found his partner. I knew who his partner was because I talk about his partner in the book. And he left the house to his partner. And his partner died in 2007. I am so mad. I could have interviewed him. And then when I, so I tracked him down completely. Then after the book came out, I was sitting with a student and I said, you know, I'm trying to find this because I, he's, he's not showing up in any cemetery. He died in Chicago and he's not in, and he didn't hit me cremates. All right. And, and then you spread the ashes somewhere. So what happened is we sent out a message on some website and I need to ask what website did we use? And about three months ago, I get a message from someone who says, you're looking for Rosine Penny, that's his name. Uh, why? I live in the Bahamas. Whoa. I don't know if you're alive now, right? I live in the Bahamas, and I just want to find out why you want to know about him, because I know how to find him. So I then respond and say, now, write it. I've written this history book. He, I knew this, and I, and I explained some of the things that I knew about him that's in the book. And the next thing I know, about a month and a half ago, I got a phone call. Sunday. And the person says, hello, I'm Rosine Penny's um, nephew. And the person said, and we got into long, I, I took a while before I say, you know, he was gay. I, 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 you know, I sort of waited for them to raise it. They did. We had a great conversation. They told me all kinds of great things about this guy. And then they said, we want, I want to let you know that he was 6'5". He was called the Clark, the Black Clark Gable. Oh. And we have a picture of him. So I immediately called the publishers. I want the picture in the book. You know, with John. John's picture's in there, full picture. I want, you know, the picture in there. Um, because I talk about how they were, had a great relationship and the things that, you know, I, I know he's, for example, John is buried in the Catholic cemetery. 
is Baptist. They don't do that unless you're related. I'm like, how did he get in there? I called the Catholic cemetery. They were nice on in Chicago. They said, well, his nephew is Catholic. And his nephew is the one who signed. Who's his nephew? Rosine Penny. Uh, his partner. Uh, uh, and then on the phone with the nephew, she said, yeah, we're Catholics. Oh, gosh. There it is. It's sealed. <laughs> so Rosine pulled a fast one on them. John is there in his military with a military uh, head because he was in World War One, <laughs> And he's in there and uh, etc. I wanted to go to the house because they lived the house was still standing in 2010 when I went back to Chicago and I wanted to go to the house and I went to the front desk of the hotel and I said I want to go to this address and uh, there was an African-American uh, person at the desk and she looks at me and she says you want to go to this address lady I said yeah she says you want to live <laughs> I went what she says you go there I'm not sure you're going to come back so you better not go so I never went, and then they tore the house down, but I have pictures of the house, and because I never made that connection, I'm sure he left so much materials and stuff, but Chicago was quite friendly to GLBTQ. Uh, there was a very interesting relationship that existed in Chicago, and uh, it made sense that, they, that he stayed in Chicago, where he would live, and she, um, you know, she was there also. But they separated at that point here. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Anybody on here? Thank you, everybody, for coming. I appreciate it.